Fans want good, meaningful, interconnected trilogies, but it doesn't always work out that way. For every Lord of the Rings trilogy, there is a Hobbit trilogy. For every Star Wars, a lesser Star Wars. And that's not even counting the plethora of unworthy spin-offs, knock-offs, and rip-offs. Is it any wonder, then, that so many trilogies slip through the cracks? Here are a few, but don't expect them all to be masterpieces. The Thing John Carpenter's self-described Apocalypse trilogy intends to cause nightmares and succeeds with a fury. Carpenter's The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness are all connected thematically and meant to be considered together. These films ask more questions about the nature of evil than they answer. What does pure evil look like? Can it be killed? Will we recognize it when it's staring us in the face? And most importantly, what can Alice Cooper teach us about the devil? Shaun of the Dead Edgar Wright's Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy began as an in-joke about treating a hangover with Cornetto ice cream, but led to a series of tangentially related genre comedies. Shaun of the Dead started it all as a film about friendship in the face of the apocalypse, where Cornetto's strawberry ice cream represented the bloody undead. Edgar Wright's feature rejected Dawn of the Dead's harsh critique of society, instead opting for a simpler statement of people good, zombies bad. Follow-ups Hot Fuzz, a police-inspired Classico Blue Cornetto, and The World's End, mint green for the alien invasion, tied it all together, rewriting genre tropes of their own to great success. The Addams Family We love The Addams Family. Most people love The Addams Family values even more. So how haven't we heard about the third film sooner? 1998's The Addams Family Reunion is that rarest of oddities, a bad movie with Tim Curry in it, good as they are as Gomez and Morticia in The Addams Family Reunion. Tim Curry and Daryl Hannah can't quite compete with Raul Julia and Angelica Houston. The other replacements fare worse. To be fair, even the original cast would have struggled to make sense of a plot where a disease turns the elder Adamses normal. Cruel Intentions Sure, Cruel Intentions kept us entertained. Ryan Phillippe's remarkably punchable pout, Sarah Michelle Gellar's cheeky threats, Selma Blair's gullibility, and Reese Witherspoon's ridiculous innocence add just enough charm to this silly misanthropic tale of almost kissing step-siblings. Following the success of the film, a Cruel Intentions TV series was shot, abandoned, and then allegedly re-edited with patched-in Skinamax ready adult content before being released as a direct-to-video prequel, Cruel Intentions 2. Of course, it's bad, but there's more. Cruel Intentions 3 is basically a lower-budget Cruel Intentions by way of Wild Things, minus what made each of those previous movies sort of interesting. Believe it or not, it's worse. Shocking, right? Dungeons & Dragons no one would blame you if you missed 2000's Dungeons & Dragons film, which beat Peter Jackson's similarly fantastic Lord of the Rings trilogy into the theaters, but was quickly obscured by it. There was one major problem with Dungeons & Dragons. The classic tabletop game depends entirely upon players' input and the narrative skills of dungeon masters for its continuing appeal. You can't just slap the D&D brand on a generic fantasy film and lure fantasy nerds into the theaters. The first film has all the hallmarks of a garbage 1980s fantasy script that was dusted off and rebranded, and features Marlon Wayans as Snails, the Jar Jar Binks of fantasy realms. There are two direct-to-video sequels. Avoid them like the plague. You know what? I got a new name for dumb. Ridley. This is the Ridleyest thing I ever heard of. Big Mama's House Taking one too many pages from the Nutty Professor section of Eddie Murphy's career playbook, Martin Lawrence put on a fat suit and played a horribly stereotypical character for cheap laughs not once, but three times. Big Mama's House and Big Mama's House 2 are essentially retreads of Mrs. Doubtfire with a flimsy FBI man goes undercover as an old lady gimmick. To his credit, Lawrence's Big Mama beats Tyler Perry's Medea at her own tired game. But it's still too close to minstrelsy for our comfort. We can only hope that Big Mama's Like Father Like Son sealed this overwrought franchise's fate. Legally Blonde Unlike its empty-headed peers, Legally Blonde rose above a tired premise and defied our jaded expectations. Then came the sequels. Legally Blonde 2, Red, White & Blonde retained its principal actress, and that's all. Everything from the Capitol Hill setting to Witherspoon's tone-deaf getup failed to impress fans and critics. The straight-to-video Legally Blondes rehashes tired blonde jokes in a prep school setting, with neither Witherspoon's charisma nor a halfway entertaining concept to distract us from its cash-grabby one-dimensionality. This movie ought to qualify as an act of war. We're surprised the filmmakers haven't been sued for damages. You can't get the people to care. Watch me. 
Desperado. Trilogies aren't cheap, and they usually require the backing of big Hollywood studios, but Robert Rodriguez's Mexico trilogy is an exception. El Mariachi, the first movie in the series, was produced for only $7,000 and was purchased by Columbia Pictures, who went on to finance the rest of the trilogy. When the second film, Desperado, replaced the lead with Antonio Banderas, the series hit its high point. Once Upon a Time in Mexico, the final movie in the trilogy, was famously made in just seven weeks, making it a fun experiment more than a cohesive movie. Rodriguez's DIY sensibilities in making the Mexico trilogy proves that awesome shoot 'em up action movies can be made for a fraction of typical Hollywood budgets. Darkman A trilogy in the technical sense only, the Darkman series follows the established tradition of an inverse relationship between quality and sequel number. Sam Raimi's original Darkman takes a stupid premise and makes it pulpy and palatable. The Darkman series' later entries neutered the movies by putting the original's director in the role of executive producer and hiring a competent, though bland, director instead. To make things even less coherent, Part 3 was originally going to be Part 2 and vice versa. That's the extent of the sequel's uselessness in the franchise. What order they're viewed in doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter, Pete. It matters. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.